So this is some of the stuff you have to talk to your clients about during programming. But for the last few minutes, let me talk a little bit about whether or not you think we're going to experience hotter summers in the next 20 years or colder summers. How many think hotter summers? <laughs> All right, then I'm going to also ask something else because this is important. How many of you grew up in homes with central air conditioning? Let me see. Look around. There's maybe a quarter or a fifth of you. How many of you have central air conditioning in your home now? All right. So there's two things that have gone on here. One of them is that we are going through some type of climate change, whether it's man-made is debatable, but still there is some climate change, at least for the rest of our lives. It'll probably not get cooler around here. And secondly, air conditioning has become ubiquitous. Even if this were a crowd in Chicago, I'd get about the same amount of hands being raised, which makes the point that we have to design our homes to be much more responsive to the heat outside and to air conditioning, whether we're doing a project in Montana or North Carolina or Austin, Texas or Chicago, air conditioning has become ubiquitous. So what are some of the big things that affect air conditioning that we might want to play with? Well, the big thing is radiation. Let's go back to high school and remember how heat transfers. It's radiation, conduction and convection. Radiation is a very powerful thing. That's the microwave oven heating up a bowl of chili in about a minute. Conduction is a, uh, the stove top heating up that same amount of chili, taking about five times longer. That's uh, conduction, about five minutes. Or the same amount of chili on the center rack in the oven using hot air surrounding, it would take about 20 minutes to get to the same temperature. So there's a real quick basic lesson in physics from high school days on the difference between radiation, conduction, and convection. So what makes us uncomfortable here in Austin is the sun and the humidity. And if you keep that in mind, that's the way you want to design your home. And by the way, blowing on that bowl of chili, so long as a microwave oven is operating, wouldn't do you much good, would it? I think pissing in the wind, you said it was OK to say very. Well, that's why many years ago, we realized this whole idea of hyperventilating our attics to get rid of the heat that was caused by radiation is one step away from useless because you're using air to move something that was produced by heat. You're literally blowing on the chili while it's still in the microwave oven. <laughs> so that's why, and that's where the concept in the 80s came from to start sealing off our attics. And we don't have time to talk about that, but if any of you have heard that idea of don't ventilate your attic anymore, that's where it comes from. Now, along these same lines, though, is the idea of where else does radiation cause a big problem, and it's coming through your windows. Shading your windows is probably the most effective thing you can do next to building a tight house so that it doesn't get bombarded, particularly by the afternoon sun. It, doesn't, it does help to have that special low E glass, but nothing like a good old-fashioned awning to shade the windows. This is an old home we renovated on 6th Street. And these awnings alone cut the air conditioning cost or air conditioning load by a third just by keeping the sun off the windows, keeping the radiation from heating up the inside of the house. It's real low tech and it works. And guess what? The windows will last a century because they're protected. Unless you think that shading windows makes the house dark, this was a pretty uh, contemporary design we did for a client who came here from California who wanted this rock star look. Um, I think, John, this is a house you would probably want to build. But look at something here. Notice we did all these fins to shade the windows. And I'm going to take you inside the living room here to show you how dark the living room is because of this shading. Now, before I do, notice the light colored overhangs and the light colored surfaces. And we take advantage of that by having reflected light. Those are those same windows. And you can see the light bouncing off the driveway or here bouncing off the pool deck and give you lots of nicely distributed natural light with no solar radiation. And that's what you want to do. So when you talk about LED lamps versus fluorescent lamps and what's the most energy efficient, don't forget about the free source of light, which is natural daylighting. That trumps all of those things. And I'm going to get to that in a minute, too. You want to do light colored surfaces because that helps amplify the amount of available light. If it's light coming down from the stairwell here, it's bouncing off the floor or off the wall, so it's a bright space. Uh, if you are thinking of those fluorescent lamps or LED lamps, remember the surface that they bounce the light off of has a big, a large effect on how much information your eyes get, because it's the information bouncing off those surfaces that is, that's coming to your eyes 
that allow you to read or see what you're doing. So you can have one third as much lighting in a living room that's got light colored floors and walls than if it's got dark colored walls. So let's sort of wrap up with this neat little interconnectivity discussion, natural daylighting and the common forms of artificial lighting and then how this all relates to energy conservation and comfort and global warming. Let's look at the kitchen as an example. The kitchen uses the most amount of energy of any home in any room in the house. It's not unusual to spend 2,000 to 25 watts lighting your kitchen at night when you're making dinner, particularly if you have halogen lamps or your under cabinet lights and things like that. Well, also, um, these lights can do, they, they use a lot of energy, but they also produce a lot of heat. For every 100 watt light bulb is like having another person in the kitchen, or putting it another way, for every watt of energy you consume, it's producing about three and a half BTUs of heat. So if you could come up with a creative way of lighting your kitchen using less lighting, you'd also produce a lot less heat for your air conditioner. And if you use very energy efficient lighting, for example, every normal light bulb you change out with a fluorescent of the same uh, light output, you save a quarter of a ton of coal being burnt our, at our local power plant every year. Just for changing out a 75 watt bulb with an 18 watt fluorescent, you save a quarter of a ton of coal being burnt down, burnt down in Fayette County, which affects our air pollution, which affects things like global warming. So it's little stuff added up can make a big difference. And it doesn't have to be weird looking, but remember what I said, the light colored surfaces are important and putting the task lighting near the task. These lights right here are only about three feet above that countertop, which is where a lot of the food prepping will go on. So it has to travel a short distance to bounce off the countertop to come to your eyes. And they're all 15 or 18 watt fluorescents. So there's only about 500 watts being burnt in this kitchen, not 2,500. So you save 2,000 watts times 3.5 BTUs a watt. That's, about, that's more than a half a ton of air conditioning you don't have to put into this house because of the lighting and because of the countertop color. It's kind of interesting, isn't it? I love all these connections. So don't do, don't do dark countertops, especially as we get older. It's tougher for those of us as our eyes deteriorate to see things against a dark surface. Always do light colored countertops. You'll also make for less heat in the kitchen and save a lot of energy. And it doesn't have to be a particularly contemporary kitchen. This is ours. These are all fluorescent lights, by the way. Everything in here, it's a very warm looking kitchen, but it's all very low wattage fluorescent. And here, by the way, before I get off that point about heat, keep in mind stoves put out a lot of heat. A typical stove top wastes about 60% of its energy by heating up the kitchen. These old 1970s um, cooktops that are now popular again, they're called induction cooktops, really make a lot of sense because they don't get physically hot. They transmit the heat to the food by way of sort of like microwave technology. They're about 85% efficient instead of about 30% efficient. And they don't heat up the house and your grandkids won't burn their fingers on the burner. We're all, it's, it's very much here about trying to reduce waste heat in the house because the waste heat has to be air conditioned away. So some of these thoughts I think are pretty basic, but here's another very interesting one. The best investment you can do, especially in this economy, is doing things to your own home to save energy. A lot greater return on your investment than a, bond, a stock fund or a bond fund. Saving energy, look, you're, you're earning money and you're spending money. And if you can spend less money, then your money that you've earned will go a longer distance. So the investment you put into your own house to make it less expensive for you to live every month is a better return on your investment than most of the other things. Frankly, the money you put into building your house over the next 20 years will only amount to about 20 to 25 percent of the cost of owning your house. This was a study by the National Association of Home Builders that showed that building this family house, this too was nearby, uh, for a family of, in this case, five, they were going to own it for at least 20 years. The cost of building it was about a quarter of the cost of owning it. The cost of heating, cooling, and running it, the energy bills, and the maintenance and insurance are twice to three times the cost of building the house over the next two, two and a half decades. So by design, you can greatly affect the cost of energy consumption, even the cost of insurance. That metal roof will make the right type of metal roof is cheaper to insure than a shingle roof or other types of metal roofs. So we save on insurance costs too, as well as energy costs. But look at the life cycle. Look at the cost of owning the thing, the house, the remodel, versus how cheaply you can build it. 
And uh, I hope you appreciate this stuff. By the way, there's a great store that's trying to break into this market, selling smart, energy efficient, and green stuff down in Westgate. I, I think these guys are trying to go toe to toe with Home Depot. I would patronize them. I think they're trying to do a good thing. I hope I sparked your thoughts today about some common sense ways of saving energy and doing the right thing. And I'll stop here so you can ask me some questions. Thanks. Ah, we do have some questions. Good. This is always the fun part. Go ahead, sir. How do you feel about film on the windows instead of shading it? Well, let's put it in perspective. If you can stop the radiation from hitting the glass, that's by far the most effective thing. So that's shading it. Then the next thing you could do is maybe put solar screens in front of the glass to absorb a lot of that solar radiation before it hits the glass. That's the second best thing. The third best thing is then tinting the glass. But you have to understand the glass is heating up. So you're, you're not going to have as efficient a system as shading it in the first place. I would put solar screens in front of that glass before I tinted it, if it were my house. Yes, sir. How about radiant barriers in, in attics? That was actually my master's work at UT. Here we and extra questions. insulation and so forth. Well, the question is, how about radiant barriers in attics and how that relates to attic insulation? It goes all the way back to that slide I showed you where we had uh, that graph or those pictures of how heat is transferred. The radiant barrier is a great way of reducing heat transfer because it stops radiation. So it's incredibly effective to do. And um, if you have a radiant barrier, then the attic heats up less. If the attic heats up less, then you have less work for the insulation to do. We, without getting into too much building science right here, we try to do a combination of a radiant barrier some ventilation and insulation so that we can take care of all four, all three forms of heat flow. But did I answer your question? I, I did it two years ago and I thought it was a good idea and evidently it was. Yeah, did you, you still get good cell phone reception? Well, it is a good thing to do. There is actually a product I developed a long time ago as a result of my graduate work. It's now called Tech Shield. It's a plywood with foil laminated to it directly. You may have seen that in some houses. That was directly the offshoot of our master's work at UT where we were trying to come up with a concept on how do you produce a roof to act as a shading umbrella. About the spray on stuff? It's effective but not nearly as effective. Uh, it cuts out about uh, 22 to 20, I mean excuse me, it cuts out about 65 percent of the solar radiation whereas the foil cuts out about 95 percent. Thank you. Lee. Peter, thanks for being here. Are the air hawks also a bad idea? Yes, the air hawks are, um, I think, what you're seeing right there, Lee. You're trying to fight the heat caused by radiation by blowing air through the attic, and it's just not a very effective way of dealing with the problem. Maybe another way of looking at it is you could put a little fan inside your car to be blowing air through it if you left it parked out in the sun. But wouldn't your car be a lot cooler if you just parked underneath a tree? So, so the best roof is not to have any holes in the roof for any type of ventilation on your seal structure with the insulation in Generally speaking, but there are some details that I have to talk to you about with the answer. We, and I didn't put that slide in this talk because I didn't think we'd have enough time, but the ideal roof ventilates right underneath the roof itself, but the attic is sealed. Uh, Ma'am, in the back, in the green. Well, that's interesting because we've got a long, what should be next to prolong the idea of the cons conservation power plant was her question. What's next? Well, the city did jump into giving rebates for solar systems and things of that nature. But I think we have a long way to go to go back and still weatherize the homes. There's an awful lot of weatherization and shading of windows and light coloring of roofs that we can do before we start investing in solar panels. By some people's calculations, you'll get about 10 to 20 times the return on your investment by helping people figure out ways of saving energy with their homes instead of investing in ways of producing energy like renewable energies. I, I'm a fan of renewables, don't get me wrong, 
but let's get the basic stuff work. Like you saw with that one project, it doesn't really matter that there are solar panels on the roof if the windows are unshaded in the afternoon. So shading your windows would be a whole lot more uh, beneficial way of saving energy dollars and putting solar panels on your roof. Barry, is this a, is this a question that I'll be embarrassed about? Barry is the one who brought me here, by the way. He heard me speak at the West Austin Rotary, and he recruited me to come downtown to help educate you guys. <laughs> talk, you showed your pool at your house, and I had the feeling you were going to talk about it as it relates to energy. Yeah, I, and I was, and that's right. I, I skipped over that, didn't I? But the point about the pool, he was asking about the pool with regard to energy conservation. And what I did was... Um, I found out that with that swimming pool, they use a lot of energy. As a matter of fact, swimming pools use more energy than air conditioning, heating, and water heating and lighting in most Southern American homes. So you want to make sure you're not running your filter any further, any more than you have to, and you want to invest in a very energy efficient pool pump. And you know, I left the slide out. But the, what I realized is when I spent about $800 and bought a much more efficient swimming pool pump. It was a Pentair pump, it is a brand. I saved twice as much energy a month as that $16,000 solar system. The new pump saved me about $65 a month, whereas that solar system was saving me about $25 to $35 a month. And I'm glad you brought that question up. And I was trying to make the point, use your energy wisely. Look where you're wasting energy and see if there aren't some things you can do to stop the water from coming through the dam that way. Yes, sir. How are double or triple pane windows, comparatively speaking, to you know, solar shades? And That's a good question, too. How are double or triple pane windows, comparing, comparatively speaking, to uh, just shading the glass? And you already gave me the answer. Shading the glass is much more important than worrying about the R value or the insulation value of the glass. So. In this climate, now not in New Jersey or in Minnesota, but in our climate, shading your windows will save you more energy than replacing them with double pane windows. If you have a good ceiling single pane window, shading it will be much more effective than replacing with a double pane window. Yes, sir, in the dark. Oh, there's, there's a great deal of emphasis because of the water problems on low water usage in the yard, even eliminating all sorts of grass, uh, uh, using uh, uh, different types of hardscape. Uh, yes, yep, zero escaping. Uh, what effect would moving from a grass yard, for example, to one that might be decomposed granite or other types of materials, what effect might that have on the house? Two. Uh, the effect he was talking about is, he, he was actually addressing the idea of intense zero escaping or water conserving landscaping and what effect will that have? Interesting, and I didn't get to address this, maybe we should have an hour lunch next time. Uh, <laughs> there is a water conservation strategy that basically showed that you use about three to four, maybe 5,000 gallons of water a month inside your house, but in a summer day, if you've got an urban lot, you could use 10 to, an additional 10 to 25,000 gallons watering the yard outside. So that's why the city was putting so much effort into promoting xeriscaping because that's where we use the most amount of water. And I saw that in my own home. We will literally use 25,000 gallons more a month in the summer than in the winter because of the, uh, what we're doing with the yard. So we're getting very aggressive with our xeriscaping. Having said that, um, you want to be careful about making surfaces around the house that are going to increase the heat. So you don't want to do dark surfaces. If you're going to do decomposed granite, that's good, but don't do dark stones or things like that that'll increase the urban heat island effect. Grass is pretty nice about keeping things cool. The best thing is probably ground covered that doesn't require as much watering, but still keeps things cool. And am I being pulled down off the you stage? You are, you here? are. This is the hook. I am. All right, the big hook. Well, thank you very much for coming out.